Well, we are moving into carbohydrates. Um, I spent last lecture talking about a lot of structural features of carbohydrates. Today I will continue talking about that, um, uh, more complex carbohydrates. Um, and then after that, we will turn our attention to the phenomenon of signaling. Um, and signaling is a very important uh, process because it's the way by which cells communicate with each other. One thing I neglected to mention last time, and I didn't realize it until we got into the song, was I hadn't told you what a Hayworth structure was. So you saw it, I just didn't give you the name of it. So I want to make sure I get that to you, and that's shown right here. So when we draw the uh, stick figure structure like you see on the left, uh, that's known as a Fisher form or a Fisher structure. And when we draw it in the circular form, as you see on the right, that's a Hayworth. Okay? So that's what the song was referring to with respect to a Hayworth structure. So keep those in mind. Okay. Um, I want to start talking today about disaccharides. And disaccharides are, as their name suggests, uh, carbohydrates that have two sugars within them. Uh, the most common of these, of course, is sucrose because that's table sugar. And sucrose, as we will see, is comprised of glucose and fructose. Um, that combining of those two actually makes for a molecule that is chemically stabler than either glucose or fructose, as we shall see. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why table sugar um, is around the way that, as much as it is. Two other disaccharides that I'll talk about, one is lactose. Lactose is, uh, of course, also known as milk sugar. Uh, it's the most common sugar found uh, in milk. And maltose, which is a disaccharide comprised of two glucoses. And this thing is dead again. How annoying. Oh, there you go. Okay. Duh. I don't know what it did. All right. So, um, the first thing I want to talk about is sucrose. And sucrose, as I said, is glucose plus fructose. Um, the figure that I see on this, that I've put on the screen is one that you commonly see for fructose. And I think it's a totally dumb structure. In fact, I strongly recommend that you don't draw this structure on an exam. And yes, sucrose is one that you need to know the structure of. Because the TAs will not recognize it, because they're going to work from a key that I'm going to give them that's going to show the structure that will be on the right in a second. Now, the reason I don't like this structure is if we look at the numbering of these sugars, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for glucose, the way that we're used to numbering things. But now look at the numbering on the fructose, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? In other words, they've decided for convenience purposes to write it the way that they've written it. But it really isn't, as we say, anatomically correct. Because anatomically correct, and by the way, uh, sucrose has alpha-1, beta-2, diglycosidic linkages. That may not have a lot of meaning to you until I show you the actual way in which sucrose looks. Now, this structure makes a lot more sense to me. All right? We see that glucose is on top. We see that the glucose is in the alpha configuration. We see that fructose is on the bottom. And we see that it's in the beta configuration. And now it makes perfect sense when I say that this is an, an alpha-1, beta-2 diglycosidic linkage. Okay? And we can see the numbering now is consistent. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the way that we're used to seeing it. And there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on fructose, the way that we're used to seeing it. So don't use that dumb structure on the left. And why every textbook on, the, on Earth, except, except mine, uh, does that, I don't know. I mean, I really don't understand because it confuses students because it's really backwards to the way that you learn the numbering. So don't mess with the one on the left. The, name is, uh, the, the chemical name of this sugar is shown at the bottom, alpha-D-glucopyranosal. Right? So it's a glucose. It's a pure, in the pyranose form, 1 to 2. So that means that the glucose is in the 1 configuration. And the 2 refers to the next sugar, which is beta d fructofuranoside. Right? Now, I don't care that you memorize that last name. All right? That's not important. But you can see where the last name comes from, given the structures that I've shown you. 
Okay, here are uh, the other two uh, disaccharides that I mentioned, lactose uh, shown on the left and maltose shown on the right. Lactose, of course, contains galactose and glucose, and we can see that here. We also see that maltose contains two glucoses, and we can see that here. We see the numbering uh, all makes sense. We're going with the numbering in a clockwise direction, uh, as we have been for all the other sugars that we've talked about. And now we can see what's called a beta-1,4 glycosidic bond. Notice it's not a diglycosidic bond, whereas the previous one was. Why is this not a diglycosidic bond? What would it take for it to be a diglycosidic bond? Well, I'll, I'll repeat the question. What would it take for lactose to have a diglycosidic bond? What would have to be involved in the bond? It would have to involve both carbon ones, right? Right? Because that's where, the, that's where remember, a glycoside is a sugar that has had the hydroxyl on its anomeric carbon messed with. So we see one of the anomeric carbon's hydroxyls have been messed with. But the other one's free, right? That wasn't the case with fructose. When we go back to uh, we go back and look at fructose. We see both glycosidic carbons, by, both glycosidic hydroxyls are tied up in the same bond, right? Because carbon number two is the, is where the uh, uh, glyco the where the hydroxyl of the anomeric carbon was on fructose, and carbon-1 was where the hydroxyl of the anomeric carbon was on glucose, right? So that's a diglycoside. As we will see, diglycoside like this is stabler, it's chemically stabler than molecules like these, okay? The reason is, is that anomeric hydroxyl makes the molecule a little bit more unstable. We'll see why in a second. All right, so there's galactose, there's glucose, there's glucose, there's glucose. We see the beta 1, 4. So we see carbon number 1 in the beta configuration, meaning it's pointing upwards. And it's linked to what was the hydroxyl of carbon number 4 of the glucose. All right? That makes it a beta D galactopyranosyl 1 to 4 D glucose. Right? Maltose. Again, numbering scheme that makes sense. This is drawn a little conveniently, uh, but it's drawn conveniently in this case so that we keep the same numbering convention that we otherwise keep. And I, I think this is a good way to learn the structure of maltose. I'm not going to ask you to draw the structure of maltose. I'm not going to ask you to draw the structure of lactose. But I will ask you to draw the structure of sucrose. Okay? Alpha D glucopyranosyl, 1 to 4 D glucose. So two glucoses joined together, basically. All right. Well, that brings us to the subject of what are called reducing sugars. Somebody sent me an email this weekend saying, why do we care about reducing sugars? Well, we care about them because A, it's a category of sugar, and B, at a uh, little bit less important level, reducing sugars are more readily oxidized than non-reducing sugars. I'll repeat that. Reducing sugars are a little more easily oxidized than non-reducing sugars. And if they're more easily oxidized, why do we say they are reducing sugars? Gesundheit. Because for one sugar, for one thing to be oxidized, something else has to be reduced, right? Oxidation of a compound means loss of electrons. Those electrons don't disappear. They go to something, and they go to the compound that they reduce, OK? So it's fairly easy to, to, to determine if something is a reducing sugar or not by putting it in a solution of um, copper, that is copper plus 2. And if electrons are given up, it becomes copper plus 1, and that involves a color change. We can actually see that color change happen quite readily. As I said before, biochemists are lazy people. We like to find easy tests to show us things, and that's what's happening with a reducing sugar. Well, what makes a, reducing, what makes a sugar a reducing sugar? The answer is if it has a free anomeric hydroxyl, it's a reducing sugar. It has a free anomeric hydroxyl that's a reducing sugar. So we see ribose at the, on the left side, which is a reducing sugar. There, there's the anomeric carbon, and there's the hydroxyl, which has been unaltered. 
we see that lactose is a reducing sugar because even though one of its hydroxyls is tied up in a bond, the other one is free. And so that makes it a reducing sugar. We see that sucrose is a non-reducing sugar because both anomeric hydroxyls are tied up in the same bond. And since sucrose is in that configuration, it's less easily oxidized than a disaccharide like lactose or a monosaccharide like ribose. Everybody with me? Questions about that? Yes? How come the hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon is the important one? It's a good question. What was the, where did that anomer, where did that hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon come from? What was it previously? It was a carbonyl group, right? It was either a ketone or an aldehyde. All right? So those are, and particularly aldehydes, are readily oxidized. So that's the critical one. So if this anomeric carbon, this, this hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon is free, it means it can flip. It can open back out into whatever it was previously. I mentioned that briefly at the end last time. So if I have an anomeric hydroxyl, that sugar that contains it can also go back out into straight chain. It doesn't have to remain in the, circular, in the circular form. When it goes back out in the straight chain, now you've got a, an aldehyde or ketone that's there, and those can be oxidized. So that's why the anomeric hydroxyl matters. If you alter the anomeric hydroxyl, you create a glycoside, and a glycoside cannot flip back out. Okay. So it can't go back to being an aldehyde or a ketone once you've altered that anomeric hydroxyl. Everybody understand that? No? Yes, I hope yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, those are the most common disaccharides. There are, of course, other disaccharides that are out there, but those are the most common ones. I want to turn our attention now to oligosaccharides, and as their name would suggest, these are um, carbohydrates that contain more than two uh, sugar residues, and typically less than about 10. Okay? Over about 10, we would no longer classify it as an oligosaccharide. All right? Well, this is a, what's called a branched chain um, oligosaccharide. And oligosaccharides are very commonly found in glycoproteins. So again, look at what the name is telling you. A glycoprotein, glyco meaning sugar, protein meaning protein. So a sugar protein is a protein that contains sugar, right? So we commonly see oligosaccharides attached to some proteins, right? We'll see how that occurs later in the lecture today. This is a branch because you can see that middle uh, sugar is attached to two sugars on the left and only one sugar on the right. That's where the branch is actually occurring. Oligosaccharides are important because they play some roles in cellular identity. When we look at things like transplant rejection, where you've transplanted an organ from one person into another, if you don't match the proper oligosaccharide profiles that are on the surface of, of the organ that you're transplanting, then the immune system can recognize that as foreign and attack it. And that's where transplant rejection actually comes from. As we'll see later in the lecture, that also comes, uh, is important in the consideration of blood types. Blood types are distinguished by their pattern of, glyco, uh, of um, oligosaccharides on their uh, glycoproteins. Well, the next category, of course, are the, is the polysaccharides. The polysaccharides include uh, some of the compounds that I've shown on the screen here, and I'm going to show you the structures of each of those. Uh, polysaccharides, of course, are what we associate with things like the various foods that you see on the screen uh, there. And polysaccharides, uh, again, as their name suggests, has contain many, many uh, individual sugar residues linked together in a polymer uh, type of arrangement. The first one I want to start with here is cellulose. And cellulose is a polysaccharide. It's a polysaccharide of glucose. It contains only glucose residues. And you can see from this structure that it's not branched. You see only one link to the next. You don't see a splitting like you saw in that oligosaccharide that was before. So it's an unbranched polymer 
of glucose. That's what cellulose is. Now, cellulose has links between the individual sugars as, who wants to tell me? What are the linkages? They're glycosidic, but like in, in terms of, are we talking alpha-2,3, beta-1,4? Okay, so you can see that the two glucoses are joined by beta-1,4 linkages. If we, again, use our typical, nom or typical numbering scheme, we can see where carbon number one is. And looking at carbon number one, we see the bond points up, right? That's always an indication that you've got beta. And it's joined to carbon number four of the other uh, sugar as a result. Now, we'll talk later about amylose. Maybe, I think it's on the next slide, actually. Amylose, which is a related polymer. It is also a polymer of glucose. It is also unbranched. But instead of having beta-1,4 linkages, it has alpha-1,4 linkages. There's a big difference between those. We can digest amylose. Amylose is a big component of starch. Our, digested, our digestive system is set up very well to break that down. Our digestive system will not touch this guy. So beta-1,4 versus alpha-1,4 might seem it's like a very minor thing, but it's a very big thing in terms of digestion. The reason that things like lettuce and greens that you eat and so forth are roughage are because your body is not digesting them. They're staying intact as they're passing through it. So your digestive system will not break those down. If you're an animal scientist and you know, for example, of, of um, ruminants like cows, cows have a different uh, digestive system than we do. And they contain within their rumen, which is a part of their di digestive system, bacteria that contain an enzyme that will break down beta-1,4 linkages. The enzyme that they contain is called cellulase. Very easy to remember. Cellulase breaks down cellulose. Okay. Now that comes not from the cow, but from the bacteria in the rumen of the cow. People, the first question I always get is, well, what if we had that? Well, you'd probably have to have a, make yourself a rumen first. Okay. A Roman rumen ruins. That'd be kind of fun to say, wouldn't it? Okay. A rumen, you'd have to have a rumen first to put that in. It takes this very special environment, and you probably wouldn't want to regurgitate your food every time you ate it. You know, which is probably not much fun. Okay, so um, the second uh, carbohydrate, as I said uh, just briefly before, is amylose. Amylose is a component of starch. So when we talk about starch, starch is not one carbohydrate. But in fact, starch is comprised of both amylose and another uh, carbohydrate we'll talk about called amylopectin. Okay? Amylose, like cellulose, is a polymer of glucose. It is unbranched. And as I said, it has alpha-1,4 linkages. And you can see that the carbon number one has the oxygen bond coming off of it, pointing downwards. Okay? You see the length there, the 300 to 600, is repeated about that, that many times to make amylose. And amylose can be a very, very long chain. We can, we can break down amylose very, very easily. We have an enzyme called amylase, for example, that's in our saliva. that starts breaking down uh, amylose as soon as you put it in your mouth. There are the glucoses, there's the alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. Another view of the same thing, which actually is drawn a little bit more anatomically correct, is here. You notice in the last structure, I, sh I conveniently showed those two bonds pointing down, but that's not spatially correct. This next figure is, in fact, spatially correct. Okay? So you can see how that actually is oriented. You see the alpha uh, bond pointing downwards. Uh, you see the, I'm sorry, the carbon number one bond pointing downwards, meaning it's an alpha. And um, again, this is more realistic a depiction of the way amylose actually looks. The second component of starch, as I said, is amylopectin. And so amylopectin is our first branched carbohydrate that I've talked about, or polysaccharide that I've talked about, the first branched polysaccharide. And like amylose, amylopectin is a uh, polymer of glucose. It has mostly alpha-1, four linkages, but occasionally it has branches, as you can see, okay? So the branches that you can see are 1, 6. So that glucose on the lower left, you can see, has an alpha 1, 4 linkage, and the uh, branch upwards is a, is a 1, 6. And it's an alpha 1, 6 because it's linked to a carbon number 1 pointing downwards, all right? 
Now, the numbering on here of 7 to 11 is actually not accurate for amylopectin. For amylopectin, you typically see about 30 to 50 of those between the branches. The numbering is correct for the next carbohydrate I'm going to show you, but it's not correct for this one, okay? So there's usually about 30 to 50 individual glucoses between the, um, the branches in amylopectin. Now, as you might suspect, digesting the branches, that is the 1,6, may take a different enzyme than the, branch, than the cutting of the 1,4, and it does. And we will actually talk about that when we talk about glycogen metabolism right at the very end of the term. But those different structures, as you've seen, a beta 1,4 we can't digest, a, an alpha 1,4 we can. An alpha 1,6 is going to take a different enzyme than an alpha 1,4. So, uh, and we'll see that. Okay, so there's our alpha 1,4. There's the alpha 1,6 branches. Now, the next polysaccharide that I'm going to show you um, is, oh, by the way, th these um, amylopectin and amylose are storage carbohydrates for plants. This is where we find these two uh, things. So we talk about starch of a potato, for example. So starch contains both of those, uh, amylose and amylopectin. These are plant carbohydrate storage mechanisms. Now, when we look at the um, animal carbohydrate storage, yes? Yes. How long would it be all together? That's a very good question. Um, on the order of hundreds, um, rather like the, uh, the amylose itself. Yeah. Um, the animal carbohydrate storage form is glycogen. You know? And glycogen, as you're going to see, looks very much like amylose. It's a polymer of glucose. It's got alpha-1,6 branches. It's got alpha-1,4 links. Okay? The difference is that here, the 7 to 11 number is actually accurate. All right? That is about the number of glucoses between the branches of um, uh, glycogen. Okay? Now, that means, therefore, that glycogen is much more branched than is uh, amylopectin or amylose. Amylose isn't branched at all. And that turns out to be important because animals break down glycogen with an enzyme that starts at the end of the molecule and moves inward. That means that the more ends you have, the more you can release quickly. If you only have one end, you can only release one sugar at a time. But if you have a branched molecule that has many ends, you can release as many glucoses as you have enzymes to attack it. Okay? Otherwise, they're all waiting in line for this one at a time coming off of amylose. That turns out to be important because animals have a much greater immediate need for energy, as comes from glucose. We'll actually talk about that in the lecture uh, on uh, Wednesday. Okay. There are some polysaccharides that have modified sugars that they're a polymer of. One of those is chitin. Now, as you look at chitin, you can see, first of all, it's got beta-1,4 linkages. But the monomeric uh, sugar is not glucose, all right, but N-acetyl. Okay? It's called N-acetyl glucosamine. That's, that's the monomer sugar, N-acetyl glucosamine. You can see the N and the acetyl group uh, on the very bottom of that molecule. And chitin is what you find in the... Um, exoskeleton of, of insects. So here's chitin in the wing of a, of a sap beetle. You can see it's actually quite beautiful looking at the colors there and so forth. And it provides structural integrity. And I didn't mention that about cellulose with respect to plants, but that's what cellulose does in plants. They give structural integrity to plant cells. Plant cells are pretty rigid. Okay? And plants themselves, of course, have uh, great structural integrity. And that's coming from the cellulose that they contain. All right. There are some modified polysaccharides that um, are also, uh, one of those was, was, was um, chitin, as I mentioned. Another is pectin. And pectin is um, a polysaccharide that's used as a gelling agent. So you may have used pectin to make jelly, for example. Anybody ever make jelly? Have you used pectin? Okay, so you take the stuff and you mix in the pectin. And so the pectin 
um, is interesting in that it's a polymer of galacturonic acid. Right? What is galacturonic acid? Well, it's like glucuronic acid that I showed you the other day, except for it's made from uh, galactose. So this is basically a galactose that has had its carbon number six, the one on the top. It's had its carbon number six oxidized. Now, if I put that into a polymer, what do you suppose would happen? What would be the chemical difference of that polymer compared to a polymer of glucose, for example? Or for that matter, galactose. How would this polymer differ chemically from that polymer? I don't have a joke today. Yes? It's what? It has an acidic proton. And so what's that acidic proton going to do? What's that? It's going to dissociate. So you're going to have an ion. And if you have this in a polymer, do you suppose you're going to have a polyanionic substance? Right. Galactose doesn't have any protons that can ionize. No protons can come off of a polymer of galactose or a polymer of glucose. But if I put a, uh, make a polymer of galacturonic acid, or glucuronic acid for that matter, then what I've done is I've made a polyanionic substance. And a polyanionic substance, as its name suggests, is a long, long polymer with thousands, in some cases, of negative charges. All right. Now, I'll talk later about some molecules that have this property that our body uses for lubrication, actually, because the chemical property that they have is that they tend to be slimy. They tend to be slimy. What you see is a powdered form of uh, pectin here. But the reason that pectin forms a gel-like material is due to that sort of sliminess that it actually has. OK. Well, a very important category of molecules I want you to know about is not, they're not polysaccharides, but they're proteins that bind to polysaccharides. Okay? They're called lectins. They're actually a part of the innate immune system. So you have different components to your immune system. And the innate immune system provides a broad general protection against invading organisms. The surface of many bacterial cells contains uh, polymers of, I'm sorry, contains polysaccharides that are recognized by these lectins. And so they're there to grab a hold of them and keep the bacterium from causing problems in your body. Now, these lectins can also cause problems because they can also bind things that you might not desire they, they bind, like, for example, peanuts. Okay? Or things that are in, this, in, in peanuts, for example, that can cause problems. So sometimes when you hear about people having problems with peanuts, it's actually due to lectins that are grabbing things that you didn't want them to, to grab. Okay. There's also a mannose binding lectin that targets microbes, and that's actually what's happening in the immune system. In plants, there's a similar compound called phytohemagglutinins, okay, a long name, and they're the same for our purposes as lectins are. They bind certain specific carbohydrates. And last, bacteria use lectins and viruses use lectins to attach to cells. Now, not all bacteria, of course, attach to cells, but some do. The bacteria in your gut, for example, will attach themselves to the uh, cell wall, uh, not the cell wall, but the cell membrane of your gut so they don't get all flushed out every time you, shall we say, move things through, right? So having lectins to hold on to things on the cell surface is important. Viruses use lectins as a way of grabbing a hold of a certain specific cell receptor so they can inject their nucleic acid into them, okay? Now, the flu virus is a, a virus that has a protein called a hemagglutinin. It's kind of like the phytohemagglutinin. It's called a hemagglutinin. And that hemagglutinin is how it actually gets into your cells to infect. It grabs a specific 
receptor on the cell surface, attaches itself, and then it injects its nucleic acid. Now, one of the things about the flu virus is that on the exit from the cell, the flu virus has to cleave a specific bond in a polysaccharide. It has to cleave a specific bond. And this is for the exit, not the entry. This is for the exit from the cell. After it's done its chaos inside that cell, it needs to burst out and go out and infect other cells if it's going to be successful as a flu virus. Okay? The enzyme that the flu virus uses to do that exit is called a neuraminidase. It's the name for the, the residue that it actually cuts inside of the cell. So the drug Tamiflu works to stop the flu spread by inhibiting the neuraminidase. And so if the neuraminidase of the flu virus is inhibited, the flu virus can't exit the cell. It can't go uh, infect other cells. And in fact, what happens is it starts forming aggregates, which are not infectious. So that's how Tamiflu actually works. OK. Yes, question? Is that what you're giving in flu shots? No. Flu shots are, are you're given uh, things to stimulate your immune system to recognize proteins from the flu virus that the immune system attacks. So this is given for people who have a severe flu that has escaped either the, the um, uh, uh, immunization that you got or, as all too many people do, they didn't get immunized. It's better to get immunized because Tamiflu doesn't work all the time. Yeah. How many people here got flu shot? OK. How many people in here are pre-med and didn't get the flu shot? Oh. I never want to see any of those hands go up. No, 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 no. I close my eyes. All right. Everybody should get the flu shot. But if you're a pre-med or you're pre-health of any sort, you should be getting the flu shot. Because by not doing that, you're helping to spread disease, right? Not good. OK. Um, next topic of uh, interest are those of the glycolipids. Again, names telling you glyco meaning sugar, lipid meaning lipid. So we, these are lipids that are attached to sugars. I've schematically shown lipid here. I'm going to, I'm going to replace that with some specific lipids in just a bit. Okay. Uh, but glycolipids are important uh, components of cells. <clears throat> what you see here uh, is what's called a, uh, a glycoglycerolipid. Okay? In this case, a glycerol molecule, which is the thing that has the large carbons shown in the middle, is attached to two fatty acids. If it's attached to three fatty acids, we call it a fat. It's attached to two fatty acids. It's a glycero something. And the something in this case is a glycoglycerolipid, right? And the glyco part is shown at the very top. We have a glucose attached to this glycerolipid. There's the sugar. There's the diacylglycerol. That's what I just told you. That is a glycerol attached to two fatty acids, a diacylglycerol. Another category of glycolipid are those of the glycosphingolipids. And again, you can start to figure out the direction of this. Glyco referring to sugar, sphingolipid referring to sphingolipid. And we'll talk later about the structure of sphingolipids, so don't worry too much about the structure here. Uh, but suffice it to say, they contain sphingosine. And they sort of look like the, glycero, the glycoglycerolipids. Okay? Here we can see a simple sugar that's been attached to it. This simple sugar, in this case, again, is glucose. And when we have a simple sugar attached to a sphingolipid, we create a molecule called a cerebricide. Okay? And yes, that's, a, that's an important term. There's the glucose, a simple, a single sugar. Okay? If, on the other hand, instead of attaching a simple single sugar, we attach a very complicated set of sugars to it, we create a compound called a glycoside. And the only difference between the last compound and this one is the uh, composition of the carbohydrate. This is a complex carbohydrate that's attached. And glycosides, uh, I'm sorry, gangliosides, I said glycoside, a gangliosides is um, uh, found in various uh, neuro, uh, brain cells, as are cerebricides. The sphingolipids are very common lipids found in your brain. Okay? If you want to memorize that structure, I'm assuming. 
OK. Um, now we talk about glycosylation. And glycosylation involves usually the attachment of some of these carbohydrates to other things, usually proteins. All right. The first ones uh, are the glycosaminoglycans. You've already seen one like that. That was the uh, um, pectin. Pectin was a polymer of glucuronic acid, so it was a long polyanionic substance. And that's what, what a glycosaminoglycan is. Glycose, glyco, of course, sugar. Amino, referring to an, they have an amino component, all right? And that a galacto, galacto, galacturonic acid polymer did not have that, so it would not technically be a glycosaminoglycan, although it would behave very much like one. And glycan referring to a long string of these, okay? Glycosaminoglycans. A second category are peptidoglycans. Peptidoglycans are peptides or proteins that are linked to the compounds above, that is the glycosaminoglycans. So you take a protein, you attach it to the glycosaminoglycans, and you have a peptidoglycan. A third compound I've already talked about are the glycoproteins. And glycoproteins are proteins that are linked to oligosaccharides, not these long polyanionic substances. When we look at the glycoproteins, they have two different kinds of linkages. One kind of linkage is through an amine of asparagine. So the side chain of asparagine is used as an attachment point for some oligosaccharides in making glycoproteins. Okay. This occurs, actually it says, I've got that, we've got to fix that. It's, this says Golgi apparatus, it actually occurs in the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum, which tells you my next one is wrong, which says ER and Golgi, that's not correct. So I've got it backwards. The end linked happens in the Golgi and the endoplasmic reticulum. Let's do what I did last time. Let's fix it. Okay, Golgi. And E R. Oop, what happened? Oh, lovely. Okay, and the O-linked, of course, occurring only in the Golgi. Yeah, you tricky you. Okay. So now the difference of the O-linked is that the O-linked uh, compounds are found attached only to serine and threonine, threonine side chains. Okay. There we go. Okay, there's the fixed slide. So they're attached to serine and threonine residues. And you remember that serine and threonine residues, of course, are the ones that have hydroxyl side chains. Okay, uh, now memorize all these for the exam, right? So we're looking at the pattern of oligosaccharides of numerous glycoproteins, all right? So we see that yeast have a certain general structure Insects have a certain general structure. Animals have a different set of structures, et cetera. And humans uh, also, in, in the animal category, have a, a related set of structures that are there. Okay? These are general structures. If you look at the key on the left, you can see, for example, mannose is green. It's very commonly found in the glycoproteins. You also see um, um, the uh, GLCNAC. That's the N-acetylglucosamine that we talked about before that was in chitin. Okay. Those two things are the most common uh, sugars or modified sugars we see in the oligosaccharides. Okay. Now we'll talk later about how the, in the humans they, have, they all have a common core structure. Look at the common core structure starting at the bottom. They're identical on the bottom three. As we move up we get to a Y-shaped structure and all the way through the Y-shaped structure all of those are identical. So they have a common backbone that's there. And we see that's very much the same case in other animals as well, missing that uh, fucose in some cases in other animals. Okay. But basically, we see the same structure. So I like to think of that structure as a template that is modified as appropriate with other sugars for, uh, and it's actually done for identity purposes. So if I have a red blood cell, 
it may have a structure like that shown on the left for humans if it's a type A. If it's a type O, it might lack those two red things on the top. So very simple changes with respect to these uh, sugars that are on the surface of the, the red blood cell proteins. Very simple changes in these guys change the type of blood. And of course, you know if you mix types of blood, you can kill somebody if you put the wrong type in. Okay? So very important considerations. This schematically shows uh, basically what's there. Okay? A person who has um, type O blood, is, or they're known as universal donors, because they don't have things on their surface that are recognized by the um, uh, immune systems of other people. So they can be donated readily. Okay? All right. And so, again, that's just uh, differences solely in the composition of the polysaccharides on the surface. Okay. Um, the glycosaminoglycans that I promised you are here. Hyaluronin. Is that a question? Oh, I thought I said hand. Hyaluronin is a, an interesting polymer. You can see that it has a carboxyl. You can see that it has an N-acetyl component to it. And that carboxyl, like we talked about with galacturonic acid polymers in pectin, is polyanionic, meaning it's very, very negatively charged. And hyaluronin is a component of hyaluronic acid. I should say that way around. Hyaluronic acid is a component of hyaluronin. Right. The polymer is called hyaluronic acid. If you attach it to a protein, it's called hyaluronin. Now that I've confused you, I'll start that over. I showed you hyaluronic acid, okay? And hyaluronin is what you get when you attach hyaluronic acid to a protein, okay? Now, that protein has the property that I mentioned, that it is long, it's polyanionic, it's very negatively charged, and it is slimy. Sliminess goes with these things. And because it's slimy, it functions very nicely as a lubricant. So we use it in our uh, joints as what's called synovial fluid. Okay? And synovial fluid is what keeps our joints from being too sore. When you start getting low on synovial fluid, that's when people get pain in their joints. Typically when people get older, they feel that pain because they don't have as, as much synovial fluid in their joints. Other glycosaminoglycans are things that you find in snot. There's the slimy part, right? That's what's giving snot its sliminess. Okay. Other glycosaminoglycans, chondroitin sulfate, looks very much like the um, um, hyaluronic acid, but you can see instead of having H's, it's got some R's there, meaning it's got other things that are attached to it. Okay. And that is uh, what distinguishes chondroitin sulfate from hyaluronic acid. Heparin. We've been talking about heparin being an anticoagulant. And we look at heparin and we say, whoa, that guy has got a lot of sulfates on it. What's the property of sulfate at physiological pH? It's going to be negatively charged because it's going to, it's going to ionize, right? Heparin is the most negatively known molecule okay, on, the, on the face of the earth. right? There are more n density of negative charge in heparin than in any other compound that's known. Now, if you look at heparin, and I told you that it was a compound that was a, an anticoagulant, a really good question I could ask you would be, why is it a really good anticoagulant? What property does heparin have that helps stop the clotting of blood? Anybody? What's it able to do? Yes. It binds to calcium. You remember that carboxylation reaction that put the second carboxyl group on there and that positioned it so that it could bind to calcium? This guy's binding calcium. And when it's binding calcium, do you suppose there'll be enough calcium around to stimulate that clotting response? Maybe not, right? So heparin is able to do that, and that's why heparin acts as an anticoagulant. And that's why one of the reasons why one of the proteases I talked about last time breaks down heparin so it's not grabbing calcium and allows the clotting process to continue. Okay, good. We are at that time. 
Today's metabolic melody is very simple. It's to the tune of Brahms Lullaby. Okay, guys, see you on.